Hello and welcome. Uh, I'm Eddie Glaw. Uh, I'm the chair of the Department of African American Studies and the James S. McDonald Distinguished University Professor of African American Studies at Princeton University. I am pleased to be joined by my dear friend in conversation, Professor David Blight, author of the Pulitzer Prize winning biography, Frederick Douglass, Prophet of Freedom, and the director of the Gilda Lerman Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition at Yale University. Our discussion is presented as part of the New York Historical Society's Bernard and Irene Schwartz Distinguished Speaker Series. David, it's a pleasure to be speaking with you, my friend. Pleasure's all mine, Eddie. Thanks for doing this. Wow. So this, this is an extraordinary time for us to talk about Juneteenth and then to, 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 to jump into or delve into the life of Frederick Douglass. But why don't we begin by just kind of explaining what Juneteenth is and why it's such a special occasion or ought to be a special occasion for the nation. We should say in the backdrop of this, of course, uh, are the political th is the political theater surrounding Juneteenth. And talk a little bit about Juneteenth for a second so we can get our terms clear. It came out of actually Galveston, Texas, when uh, a, a union general or former union general announced, uh, I believe from a hotel balcony, some kind of formal announcement to a group of freedmen that emancipation had come. It happened on, they believe, a June 19th. And uh, then it spread as uh, the news across Texas. Galveston, of course, is on the coast, just east of Houston. And over time, it became this story of, of the day freedom came. The, the, the day an em emancipation was somehow announced. Uh, and and it, it took years in different locations, but it caught on uh, eventually as much as Emancipation Day itself, January 1st, which for a long time was, was, a, was an African-American celebration day. But it caught on in local communities in Texas and other parts across the South as a day to celebrate emancipation, as a day to commemorate the end of slavery. And now it's had, especially in the last, oh, I don't know, 30, 40 years, a new revival. It's had a lot more attention, publicity, books have been written about it, a culture has evolved around it. In their parades, there are speeches, lectures, gatherings, banquets. Uh, it's in the old, old tradition, really, of like West Indian Emancipation Day, which was celebrated across the North by free blacks, which was the day of British emancipation and British empire from the 1830s on. Um, and sometimes Fourth of July was used as a kind of celebration too, but it, but it fit into that tradition of, of commemorative days. And in this case, it meant the end of slavery. What's so um, striking about celebrating Juneteenth in this moment is that we are experiencing uh, extraordinary tumult. It seems as if the country's on a knife's edge mm -hmm. and race is at the heart of it, at the center of it. Mm -hmm. uh, the nation, the world witness uh, what some describe as the kind of public lynching of George mm -hmm. Floyd. Mm -hmm. uh, and we saw the protest erupt in Minneapolis and and then metastasize, spread like wildfire in a California summer across the country. Yeah. And we've witnessed this interesting moment where uh, protesters have destroyed, have attacked in some ways, the mm. symbols of the Confederacy. We yeah. Robert E. Lee statues falling in Virginia, um, slave auction blocks being removed in Birmingham, uh, yeah. Confederate statues being moved. And it seems like uh, history is haunting us yeah. in this moment. So it makes sense that we would turn to Douglas now. Mm -hmm. Give a little context, David, for how we ought to understand these monuments to the Confederacy. And then let's use that as a segue to, to Douglas. I remember reading in your amazing uh, biography Douglas called these folks the apostles of forgetfulness. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. let's talk. He called them even worse things. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. So let's talk a little bit about where these statues fit, these memorials fit 
yeah. within this complex history that Douglas is in some ways at the center of. Yes, well, the monuments, uh, hundreds and hundreds of them, are really manifestations of ideas. They're manifestations of what we've come to know as the lost cause tradition. And that lost cause tradition evolves right after the Civil War. Uh, some say it was born at Appomattox and the images of Lee and Grant and the sense of reconciliation. Uh, you can find other origins for that. But it, as early as 1871, Douglas had one of the best lines about the evolving lost cause right after the death of Robert E. Lee. He said, he said he was sick up to here with the, quote, nauseating flatteries of Robert E. Lee. And he said, why is it that the person who commits the highest treason gets the most laudation? Well, there are a lot of reasons for that. Lee was deemed, oh, and, and Douglas even said, why is it the man who kills the most of our countrymen is deemed the best Christian soldier? So very early on, Douglas was on the attack against the lost cause. The lost cause, though, and this is what Douglas understood, and there's so many speeches he gives on this, so many memory speeches, where he speaks at veterans reunions and, and, reunions, and he speaks at emancipation reunions. What Douglas understood is that the lost cause wasn't really about loss anymore mm -hmm. by the 1890s, especially when the big Lee Monument was unveiled in Richmond. 1890, the one that is now apparently there's a plan to remove it, which most of us in my field never <laughs> believed we'd live to see. You know, right. if we lived, if we didn't think we'd live to see a black president, we didn't think we'd ever see Lee gone either from Monument exactly. Avenue. Exactly. So, what is going on? You know, but uh, Douglas understood this as, as did other critics of the lost cause. But the loss caused by the 1890s was no longer a loss narrative. It was a victory narrative. And it was a victory against Reconstruction. It was a victory story against the great changes of the Civil War. It was a victory against Black suffrage. It was a victory against all the promising potential of Black equality. So when the monuments go up, most of them do go up between the 1890s and about 1920, in that 30-year period, is the period of the deep creation of this American apartheid. The monuments, as many people are now finally learning, were a creation of this era of racial separation. And the racial separation was not just in all these myriad of Jim Crow laws, it was in historical memory. Mm -hmm. We created a segregated memory. We created a divided memory of what this war had been about. And at the heart of that, was this story of reconciliation, a reconciliation of North and South, a healing of North and South, which of course had to happen on some level, but there never really was a sufficient or for that matter, a really honest national attempt at a racial healing. That's the great failure of that era, that it, that it evolved with, with, with two kinds of separate historical stories. And by 1910, 1920, the lost cause tradition is, is a national tradition. Right. In fact, W.B. Du Bois wrote a great piece, I think 1922, in the Crisis Magazine, where he said he was sick up to here with, with all the laudation of Robert E. Lee again. And he, he too wondered that late in the story, how could this be? That Lee has become a greater hero, he said, than Lincoln. You know, it's fascinating, David. I I, I was I, I wrote about uh, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. delivering uh, a speech in in, in uh, early of 1968 at the 100th birthday celebration of W. E. B. Du Bois. Yeah. And it's a reflection on uh, that section of Black Reconstruction on the propaganda of history. I my instinct is that Vincent might have had something to do with this this speech. Vincent Harding, Vincent Harding. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but 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 it's interesting. Uh, as King is reflecting on Reconstruction, he says that Americans have had their minds uh, kind of uh, kind of distorted by the poisonous fog of lies mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that flow out of the account of Reconstruction. And of course, right now we're not 
We're not talking about Frederick Douglass, although we are. This is this is at the heart of Race and Reunion, that classic book of yours, where where mm-hmm. the way in which public memory works and how mm-hmm. how you uh, in so many ways uh, give content and depth to that that extraordinary formulation by C. Van Woodward in the strange career of Jim Crow about the reconciliation between the North and the South yeah. taking place on the back or the neck. There's that neck again. Oh yeah. Black folks. So talk a little bit more about this public memory, this the way in which reunion required in some ways mm-hmm. uh, this this redacted account of, of, of who we are as Americans. Yeah, well, in the telling of history, as you well know, and you and you deal with this in your new book on Baldwin, and maybe we can get to that too. There are little lies. There's small truths, big truths. There are little lies, and then there are big lies. You know, little lies are this happened here and not there, or whatever dates. But a big lie is is a story that just sinks deeply into a culture. It becomes part of a cultural identity. It becomes an origin story. It becomes the story in which people want to believe they're living. And that is kind of what the lost cause became. And here was the dilemma. Now, this is kind of the, uh, you know, an argument at the heart of that book, Race and Reunion, is that in the wake of the Civil War, the country had to put itself back together politically, legally, socially, and even try to do it morally and racially. But it had this struggle between these two profound ideas. One of them was healing, but the other was justice. And you've just had this massive civil war that slaughtered over 700,000 people, emancipated 4 million people from slavery, also in a very bloody process. We forget that sometimes. Emancipation didn't just come about uh, because people moved somewhere. There's a big death toll in, in emancipation itself a number we may never fully know. But how do you have healing and justice in a society that has just experienced this kind of civil war? And in a society now with its most profound problem in its history, its identity, its law has always been race. It has always been slavery. And now you get a reinvention of that. You get a reinvention in the three great amendments to the Constitution, a second founding, as we so often call it now. Uh, you know, a second constitution, as we so often call it now. But that was a revolution, a transformation. And as always, revolutions cause counter-revolutions. And one of the most powerful counter-revolutions we've ever experienced is the counter-revolution of the white South through the then Democratic Party, Mm -hmm. a counter-revolution of white supremacy, that slowly but surely, actually rather rapidly, took back control of their societies, their state governments, and their futures across the South. And what in the end occurs is that you never really do have healing and justice. Healing for whom? Justice for whom? Mm. The trouble with what happened to the memory of the Civil War and the end of slavery in this country is that we never found a balance between that healing and justice. But maybe, just maybe, what we are experiencing now, well, first of all, we know we are experiencing now yet another reckoning with that story. And the fact that so many of the protesters now in small towns in Virginia, in large cities, in Richmond itself, are actually going to the Confederate monuments to engage in their protests, and in some cases are tearing them down, tells us that whatever level on which they understand all that history, they know how important that past was in creating the world in which they now are living. So we're having a reckoning with police violence, we're having a reckoning with law, we're having a reckoning on all kinds of levels, but one of the reckonings we're really having now is with our past. We are facing our past right now. And and isn't this usually the case, Eddie? I mean, the more you study history, the more I do. You know, we can have all the theories we want about how history occurs. But the change in history really comes as a response to the shock of events. 
And sometimes it's a, it's a single solitary event like this murder of George Floyd. Right. You know, if you'd have told somebody three weeks ago, there's going to be a police killing in Minneapolis. Oh, really? You know, we've had a lot of those. And this one is going to just cause worldwide protest and it's going to cause a political concussion in this country like almost never before. You'd have said, but how? how? None of the others have. Well, that's another issue, isn't it? Because the political context in which this is happening, I think, has a great deal to do with why this response is happening. Some of those protesters are out there saying, you know, I'm sick of this Trumpism. Right. I'm sick of this political situation in this country. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sick bo top to bottom yeah. with, with, with our institutions not functioning. It's almost as if there's a summary judgment that America is broken. Yeah. Um, there's this startling image in the protest of this. I think it's the, the, the Robert E. Lee statue in Richmond. It's yeah. tagged with all sorts of graffiti. Yeah. And then they have an image of George Floyd yeah. projected on the side of it. It's a Amazing. startling, startling it moment. Um, but, but I wanted to ask you. Protest, you know, protest is performance art. Sometimes. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted to ask you, there is the, the, the story that you tell of, 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 of the collapse of Reconstruction, of mm -hmm. America's refusal in that moment to be otherwise. I mean, I always tell my students when I talk about this moment, I saw we could read just the various editions of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass and see the shift. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. in the early iterations of the poem, you actually see uh, mm -hmm. his abolitionism. He even has a black character in the poem. By the time we get to the last edition, he's redacted all of it out because mm -hmm. although he was anti-slavery, he was not for the idea of extending citizenship to these people he thought right. were no different than baboons, as he wrote in his editorial in Brooklyn. But I'm, I'm, I'm struck by this moment of betrayal, and I want to turn to Douglas in this moment, because one of the most powerful aspects of your, of your Pulitzer Prize winning biography is the way in which you delve into his later life. Mm. Mm. Here's, this, here's the lion, the mm. sage, mm. witnessing all of what you mm. just described. Talk a little yeah. bit about how Douglas processed this moment of betrayal. He processed, processed it with great difficulty. And you're right, the older Douglas, the aging Douglas kind of took over the book for me. Part of that was the sources I was privileged to find in a private collection, which was all about the last third of his life. And it opened up windows into that part of his life that we'd never seen before. You know, we've always been fascinated with the young Douglas, the heroic Douglas, the escaped slave Douglas, the, the young orator that just takes over abolitionism. But this aging Douglas became a kind of political insider. He's the old radical outsider who now has a foothold inside the Republican Party to a degree. And then finally, inside the federal government, he gets three appointments from three different Republican presidents. But my God, the, the, the sharp fence, that, that barbed wire fence he had to try to straddle was staying loyal to the Republican Party and yet still being the voice of a radical critique of what was happening to his country. One of the best places to see that, to see his deep worry, which is almost too mild a way of putting it, is 1875. Mm. It's a 4th of July speech. It's a, it's a new 4th of July speech. He gives it in Washington, D.C. to a black audience. It's an outdoor thing up in, up in Unionville in Anacostia big it's like a big festival right. it's an amazing piece of work he gets up in front of them and he he says he anticipates the following year which will be the u.s centennial uh he says next year we will have hosannas to our glorious uh, liberty and republic and he said if if war among the whites brought freedom to the black what will peace among the whites bring? The next year's a big, pivotal presidential election, which in effect is going to bring about, essentially, the legal end of Reconstruction. He says, what happens 
when there's a real peace among the whites, by which he meant this reconciliation that's happening all around him. And what a prophetic, or at least prescient, statement that was. Because for the next 30, 40 years, American culture, uh, the process of reckoning with this past, did become a kind of peace among the whites. It became a peace with white supremacy in law, in culture, in assumptions, in schooling, in all kinds of ways. It always had its fierce critics, and he's not the only one. Uh, but it, it's the overcoming of that peace among the whites. And, and it's, it's, it's different now. No analogy is ever completely direct. But, you know, we've always had, a, to some degree, a kind of peace among the whites in this country um, about behavior, about law, about our politics. And here we are again, but this time the peace among the whites just got exploded. Yeah, I mean, so it seemed as if, you know, uh, we're at a crossroads. In my own mind, um, and we've alluded to both of them, you have, uh -huh. the country has faced two moments like this before. And mm -hmm. two moments. Yeah. One second founding. Yeah, yeah. Radical reconstruction and then what happens afterwards. Right. right? The dismantling of it. Yeah. And what do we get? We get racial apartheid and convict leasing and yeah. uh, and and what we call in African American history the nadir, the right. lowest point, right? It's right. marred by violence and 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 and, and cruelty. Yeah. Uh, then you have this moment in the, the second Reconstruction. Oh yeah. Which is the mid twentieth century, mm -hmm. where you you have the Black freedom struggle pushing uh, for in some ways, the fulfillment of the failure around the first reconstruction. Oh, yeah. well, that's why we call it a second reconstruction. That second reconstruction, right? And then what do we get in response there? We get calls for law and order, mm -hmm. which leads to the carceral state. Mm -hmm. uh, we get the tax revolt in California. Oh, yeah. In the face of poverty becomes black. Remember when Robert Kennedy places his hands on the side of the face of the young black girl in the Delta of Mississippi? Suddenly, poverty is is now mapped onto that black body and we want to divest, defund right, right. the New Deal. We, want, we see the beginnings of the erosion of the social safety net that the New Deal made possible. So in each of these moments, David, I'm pushing something here. Sure. In these moments, the country has a chance to be otherwise. Yeah. And then we double down on our ugliness. Yeah. We double down on the commitments. We are in such a reckoning now, as a historian who's written so incisively about these sorts of moments. What do you see and what do you feel and what do you think about where we are today? Well, gosh, uh, I hope I can figure that out uh, someday, <laughs> just like you. But, you know, really, uh, to pick, to stay with your your trajectory here of the racial reckonings we've had. Right. Reconstruction caused a counter-revolution, which we've just discussed, and so did the great civil rights movement. Uh, the 1970s, uh, for those who may not remember very well, are very much like the 1870s. That's right. There was a counter-revolution against civil rights. Uh, there were very difficult issues like busing and desegregation of school systems. It had to have answers, and it was a chaotic process. I was a high school teacher in the 1970s in Flint, Michigan, and we too were under the threat of a court-ordered desegregation, and we, I was on a commission, and we moved toward magnet schools. Everybody was trying to answer what had happened in the 60s. Mm -hmm. But lest we forget also, People should not forget that Ronald Reagan in 1980 ran against the 60s. Absolutely. He didn't just run against the Iran crisis to defeat Jimmy Carter. He ran against the 60s, the feminism, the civil rights, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so that began a new reaction, a new uh, counter revolution, if you like, the Reagan revolution. Well, but to your point about right now, or your question about right now, good Lord, I don't know. But what I do know is this. We are already experiencing, partly because of the, the coronavirus crisis, 
And now because of the racial crisis and the policing crisis, we are facing an incredibly robust debate once again about the public sector, about government, about the, the relationship of people to government. Does government work? Do our institutions function? And what have we had with Trumpism? You know, it's so easy to, you know, to criticize Trump and Trumpism now because it's, it's just too easy a target, right? I mean, it's like, why even write about it anymore? He's almost rendered himself irrelevant. However, Trumpism is another reaction. It's clearly been a historical reaction to Obama and a lot of other changes that came about in the Obama era. So we are once again going to have this roiling American debate about the, the, the relationship of people to government. And are we going to come out of this with genuinely new, let's just say it, civil rights acts from the federal government? Are we going to have a new voting rights act? That's being discussed all the time now, at least from the Democrats. I mean, if in, indeed Democrats can take back control of both houses and so on and so forth, are we going to get a genuinely new civil rights regime rooted in the changes about policing, but then moving into all other, other realms of our society, not least of which now, of course, is health policy, access to proper medicine, the terrible disparities we have suddenly all realized uh, about health in the United States. So that at least I see happening. It's been happening ever since day one of the Corona crisis. You know, can government save us? Right. I mean, I think you're right. We're, we're experiencing the, the collapse of, of the age of Reagan. Or we could call it, the, you know, Thatcherism. We can call it neoliberalism. We're seeing all of the contradictions in full view. Yeah. But what, what what I'm struck by, and I want to ask you, and I and I, I want to jump back to the 19th century for a second. That's fine. I'm always more comfortable there. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I want to I want to know what the old man would say. Mm. So he he you could you know you've lived with Douglas for so long. Mm. You mm. know he's one of the more uh, mm. one of the most profound thinkers of American democracy, and you've told us already that personally. He had to navigate his own insiders, insider position. I'm thinking Jim Clyburn. But anyway, he had to, he had to navigate his own yeah. insider yeah. position. But yet he still was prescient enough to recognize what was on the horizon, because he's already experienced all of his death personally. Yeah. Um, what did he have to draw on mm -hmm. to stay beyond the darkness of the moment? Yeah, and there were many darknesses in those last couple decades of his life, both personal and national. Right. I mean, yeah. he had 21 grandchildren and about 13 of them died in infancy and youth. And his wife dies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Douglas always drew, as I think you know, on two great old traditions. One was the Enlightenment. Mm -hmm. He was a ferocious proponent of the natural rights tradition. He never gave up on that. And therefore the preamble of the Declaration of Independence. He loved the principles of the Declaration of Independence, but it was of course always his favorite target about American hypocrisy. Exactly. The right to life, liberty, equality, popular sovereignty, the right of revolution, those principles given by nature or given by God, he never lost that. But he also drew deeply, and especially an Old Testament sense of prophecy. Uh, he was deeply steeped in the Hebrew prophets, especially Isaiah, uh, the Psalms, Jeremiah. Now and then he would just employ Genesis. Uh, he loved using the Noah's Ark story, but that's a story unto itself. Douglas believed that somehow the United States, and he was an American exceptionalist in this sense, the United States was something special. It was given this possibility. It was given this place. It was given these ideas, that it was an idea. He wouldn't give up on it, in part because he had nowhere else to go. He really didn't. And one can find that in the speech he does in 1869 called The Composite Nation. Mm 
I've written a piece recently in the Atlantic on that uh, speech. It's, it's an amazing address. It, it's actually one of his most hopeful moments. And it comes right before uh, the betrayal of Reconstruction. And this very hopeful speech, which reads like a manifesto of multiculturalism from the 1990s, or it reads like a diversity statement for American universities today, although it's much more eloquent than those mission statements. Um, it says we are a multi-religious, a multi-racial, a multi-ethnic country. We have the possibility now because of emancipation, because of the 13th and the 14th, and he, and he gives that speech right on the cusp of the 15th Amendment. He says the United States has the chance now to show the world that it can do something no one else has ever done, to create this multiracial, this nation of pluralism that actually works. And in the middle of the speech, he makes a long, robust case for Chinese immigration, which has just become a huge issue. And anti-Chinese immigration is just beginning to kick in. The first anti-Chinese immigration law is going to come in 1874 against women, and the big one doesn't come till 1882. But here is this, you know, this pluralistic vision, the one we believe we're living, the one we try to teach every day. That every elementary kid or most go to school now, today, and they're taught this image of America. It's melted all these people into, into this place where people believe in creeds. Douglas could express that with a kind of prophetic voice and an eloquence uh, better than anyone of the 19th century. It's why in the book I call him the prose poet of American democracy. And when he needed uh, to draw on, on these depths, say in the later crises, he would almost always end with some variation of either the secular enlightenment or the prophetic tradition of the Hebrew prophets and that's true right to the end, because as you know, his last great speech that he writes first in 1893, and he gives it all over the country as an aging old man who's sick with heart disease, right to the end of 1894 is his speech on lynching, uh, which he was shocked by lynching when he finally got his head around it. But he sat down, and he did an analytical speech on lynching. It's called Lessons of the Hour, where he gives you this three-part analysis of why it's happening. It's a historical analysis, and to, to a degree, a kind of sociological analysis. Um, but even at the end of that, he can still trot out, and, and it's a despairing speech. Um, after all, I mean, the, the numbers of lynchings by 1892, 93, when he writes this speech, are 200, 300 lynchings a year in the United States. And, and they're all over the newspapers. Even there, at the end, he draws off that natural rights tradition. And he said, no, he says, no one can ever put those lights out, no matter what they do to us. Now, sometimes you read Douglas in those later years and you wonder, oh, come on. Where, how do you... <laughs> How are you keeping this hope alive? Um, I think it comes partly from so much experience in his life of having to do that, of, of, of carrying that mantle, of, of having to have something to say that gives people some kind of redemptive hope. Um, because if he couldn't, they had to give up. Yeah, I mean, in some ways, when we tell the story of Douglas, he can become emblematic. Yeah. Of a certain Symbolic. kind of yeah. understanding of the American project, right? Mm. You're, you know, my man, my guy, Jim Baldwin, Jimmy, Jimmy Baldwin, by the time he dies in 1987, mm -hmm. he's saying, I feel like a broken motor. Right. Yeah. I know I was right. I kept saying, I kept telling. So mm -hmm. he said, but you can only go to Texas so many times, right? Yeah. There, there is a way in which Baldwin, in the tradition of the old Hebrew prophets, oh, yeah. uh, uh, is deeply concerned that that story has strangled the life mm -hmm. out of the country. Mm -hmm. And that he has to figure out how to get us out of it so that we can imagine ourselves anew. He still believes in the new Jerusalem. 
Yeah. yeah. But it is not bound by, right, um, this, this American story, right? He's not going to end on that note in the face of, of, of those bodies that Douglas ended on, right? So I asked the question because I'm thinking, is Douglas in some ways a tragic figure uh, when we think about the story of the country well, and him? He, he may be, that's, I love that question. He's less personally a tragic figure than he is the, uh, in some ways, embodiment of a sense of tragedy. I think Douglas had a long, well-earned sense of tragedy. His storyteller, I mean, the guy was a, you know, a consummate storyteller. He, he would find a way to put into a metaphor whatever he's trying to do that you just, get hit between the eyes with and you can't forget. Um, he, could, he could develop a tragedy into forms of redemption, which is you know, one of the definitions, or at least of catharsis, which is one of the definitions of tragedy. Um, but I, you know, and God did Baldwin have a sense of tragedy. I'd like to ask you one question about Baldwin. From where did Baldwin's deep sense of, a, of history come from. I've written on Baldwin too, and the, most of what I wrote was about this idea of how he came by this. He's always writing about history in whatever form he writes, even the fiction. Where does that come from in him? You know, I, I'm not quite sure. You know, it mm. could be um, uh, that history is so present in the way in which, how can I put this, history so overdetermines the very task of self-creation uh -huh. for uh -huh. black people. So if you read Baldwin in the tradition of Emerson, yeah, just bringing Emerson across the tracks, yeah, right. This kind of and they may be the two greatest essays in America, essayist exactly. in American letters. So what does it mean to bring Emerson across the tracks? It's not. It's not an unfettered perfectionist enterprise. Yeah. That reaching for a higher self is overburdened. It's it's tethered to yeah. a past that continually haunts. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It, it is it is ever present. So Baldwin is constantly interrogating yeah. the way those ghosts shape and inform and, yeah. and limit and constrain the very task of creating a new self. Mm -hmm. The very task of reaching for a new self, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's um how can one put it? How does one uh, think about self-creation mm. or perfectionism in the midst of brokenness and mm. wound? Mm -hmm. You have to tell a story about that brokenness. You have to tell a story about that wound. And when you do so, it throws you squarely into the nightmare of history, yeah. it seems to me. So yeah. he, he's, because of what he's preoccupied with, Mm. It forces him to turn in that direction. Yeah. But, you know, here we are in this incredible moment, this inflection point, yeah. where the nation has to grapple with yeah. its ghosts. And thank God for your work, David, but <laughs> you, you, <laughs> you give us a compass as we struggle uh, uh, with this moment. Well, well, David, I want to thank the New York Historical Society for once again making uh, you know, affording us an opportunity to run our mouths and think together in public. You know? <laughs> what a blessing. So I'll, I'll follow you anywhere, Eddie. <laughs> <laughs> and vice versa, my friend. Oh, well, thanks, Eddie. And thanks for doing this. And God, we could do this all day. Let, let's oh, do it again. We'll do it again about your book. That would be great.